You'll just have to go to your local feed store and have a look. There is another session for folks that if we can't fit everybody in this session, we have it's back to back. I'm going to give this presentation again, so we can get started as soon as we get the roll call. Huh? We got a clock and we're running just on time. We we're supposed to start at 9:30, weren't we? All right. Well, we were all here. Things always run late for these events, I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I've got I've got copies for everybody at the end here of kind of a synopsis of my two-sided that I printed out. So you don't have to worry about taking notes so much as it'll be a synopsis there, unless there's something that grabs your attention. It'll save you having to take massive notes. I couldn't help this morning when I was on my on my computer to research. I thought in my dreams about the origins of chickens, and there was some interesting information about the origins of chickens, the history of chickens. The Latin name Gallus domesticus, and the wild chicken is Gallus gallus. They're first domesticated from wild red jungle fowl, Gallus gallus, that still runs wild in South and East Asia. And they hybridized with the gray jungle fowl, which is Gallus sonorati. I think we can, yeah, this history might, well, let's keep the door open. We, we might get filled up. I think this, this is kind of background that if somebody comes late, they're not going to be out anymore. Just to get warmed up. About 8,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, just blew me, blew me away that we've been, chickens have been domesticated that long. Recent research suggests there have been multiple origins in distinct areas of South and Southeast Asia in North China, Thailand, Burma, and India. Wild chickens. Since the wild progenitor of chickens is still among us, comparisons of behavior and other changes that exist are available to us. Domesticated chickens are less active, have fewer social interactions, are less aggressive to would-be predators, and less likely to go looking for food sources other than what you give them. Other changes include increased adult body weight, simplified plumage color, egg production starts earlier, it is more frequent, and produces larger eggs. So that's what we've done to the wild chicken in 8,000 years. So the multiple sources of domestication all through China, going back 4,000, 5,000 years, and as well as New Kingdom Egypt, Burkina Faso, and, and Ghana, they arrived in the Iron Age, which is mid first millennium AD, relatively late. And originally, this was an interesting for me, is that chickens were brought to Polynesian islands from Southeast Asia in the Lapita expansion. That's the, one of the first po Polynesian expansions where they sailed out when the when the uh, the Ice Ages were still on and the water level was still low, the, the uh, continental shelf went way out and they could actually walk out to Australia, places like that, because of the Ice Age. And so they brought chickens with them 3,000, well this is 3,300 years ago. It was assumed that they had been brought to the Americas by the Spanish conquistadors, but au contraire, pre-Columbian chicken was identified at several sites in South America, in particular Chile. So they were brought over all the way to Easter Island, and then from Easter Island is a short hop to South America. All right, so my name is Jake Kowatsky, if I didn't say that earlier. This is Backyard Chickens in the City. Make sure you're in the right place. I'd like to ask, turn off the cell phones if you haven't already. About my appearance, this, uh, unfortunately, I'll, I'll try to give you my good side. <laughs> I had a bike accident uh, Tuesday, late Tuesday, and so it, it looks a lot worse now than it actually did Tuesday. Black and blue kind of, you know, just seems to go on and on. So I haven't been in a barroom fight or anything like that. Uh, Jason Raven, the organizers of this event, had originally asked a young, vivacious woman to give this talk, but 
Before she left for New York City a few months ago, she passed on my name to these organizers. I am semi-retired, working from home in publishing. I do all my work by email with India and New York City. And amazing, I can send my projects off to India at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night, and of course it's 10 hours later, it's Monday morning, they're, ready to, they're working already. And uh, this is an advantage, I think, if, if you have somebody at home all the time. We have, uh, besides myself, there are four others living in the house, and we have couch surfers, and we have people all around it all the time. So that helps to have at least one person if there are predators, daytime predators, or nighttime predators. Somebody's got an ear out, and they can holler and get me if they can't deal with it themselves. For the last six years, I've kept as many as 10 chickens in my backyard in a 30 by 20 enclosure, closing them in at night in a coop that we built ourselves from a design I found on the internet. Occasionally, we have excess eggs to sell or barter. And about me, I grew up on a small farm uh, in South Wisconsin and lived most of Oh, about 30 acres, which is pretty, like a hobby farm size. We didn't make a living of it. But I lived most of my adult life before coming to Savannah six years ago in an income-sharing commune of 100 people in rural Virginia, Twin Oaks. You may have heard of them. They're popular for their tofu, and they have a seed business, Southern Exposure Seed Company. I've been around poultry all my life. Everybody hear me well? Good. I have a good... Loud voice, so good. And this is a good live, live room. Uh, as a boy, one of my chores, as soon as I got up in the morning and had breakfast, was to open up the chicken coop and let the chickens out and feed them and water them. And in Wisconsin in the winter, well, you had to break the ice and pour hot water in and hope that it lasted a few hours before it froze again. But that was only maybe one month of the year that it was extremely cold. An advantage in having a, we only cleaned out the chicken coop in the spring so that the heat generated by all that chicken manure was a good thing in some ways when it came to uh, that climate and the, before global warming. And then uh, when I got home from school again, it, I, it was my job to collect the eggs and close them up at night. Besides chickens, I raised geese and turkeys. So when I get up in the morning, it's almost automatic to, to think about the critters that depend on me out in the yard since I've been doing it since I was a kid. This is the way I was raised. So uh, that's an advantage in the rural upbringing, I think, that is that you have a, a sense of the larger world and responsibilities apart from your own. I had to make all the school lunches too before I went to school. So I was a busy little kid. Right. Part of uh, our, my life and lively is uh, chicken jokes. <laughs> or first of chicken jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the basketball court? He, he heard the referee calling vowels. <laughs> Which side does the chicken have the most feathers? On the outside. Corny. You can grow it. Uh, here's a little show and tell. This is a traditional toy that my brother carved. He was my chicken mentor, my older brother. And you notice the rooster is not working, he's just watching. <laughs> Most of them, he's added that detail. Most of them only have the hands going up and down. You know, it's kind of noisy, but maybe we should just not swing it around, but just pass it around and have a look. Okay, here we are. So why bother keep hens in the city anyway? If you're here, you're probably interested in, uh, in getting, might be getting serious about it. Anybody actually doing hens in the city now? One? So no, Not two? Not in the city, but I'm, I've got, we've got something uh, kind of uh, rural. Yeah, how far, how far are you from town? We're about an hour from here. Do you have a, an acre? How much land you got? No idea. <laughs> oh, just a big, big piece of land? Yes, sir. Do you have cows? We don't have cows. We've got seven chickens. We have one recently died. Oh, yeah. And we've got like five cats. 
Oh my gosh, yeah, you got it. A dog. Menagerie. The spot that our chickens fill in a little ecosystem that is our backyard is crucial. We have, as well as chickens, we have a, a market gardening. We have two and a half lots, so, and it's a south location, south orientation, so we have a great winter garden set up. And in Savannah, we even haven't had a frost yet where we are. So we've, especially this winter, we have cuckoo greens that we sell at the farmer's market on Saturdays. <laughs> now we enjoy the, the eggs cooked in creative ways. In short, the short times of the year that our hens have not been laying, it's too hot or they've been molting. Molting means they're shedding their feathers. They do this once a year, usually when it's the hottest time of the year or when they're, and they have to, in order to produce a new set of feathers, they, it requires a lot of protein. Feathers are pretty much entirely protein. So if you find feathers, put them in the compost pile. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, in fact, in chicken factories, you can get a hold of feathers very cheap, and they make great addition to your compost fertilizer. We bought commercial eggs when our, so when our chickens were not laying, and the product of the industrial egg factories are a sad substitute for the eggs that our happy homes produce our chickens produce at home. Happy chickens, leaving unstressful lives, enjoy the sunshine, scratching in the bare earth, looking for bugs. They don't do that in the big factories. You know, they, you've seen these racks of chickens piled up in, and they're, they get, I think that by law they have to have so many square feet, but it's the minimum. It's a terrible situation. I think it's something it's, like eight inches by ten inches. Is it that little? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's I've a, just finished reading Eating Animals. If anybody wants to read about chickens, that'll convince you to get your own chickens. Or watch Food Inc. <laughs> yeah. Food Inc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's another one. Similar. Yeah. You yeah. know, we got a lot of resources here. Our hens provide other services. They turn over the compost pile for us. Our compost pile is right there in the yard, and that's their favorite spot. They eat whatever green things emerge in their yard, and then we don't require a lawnmower. In fact, we don't have all, and our entire lawn has been pulled up, and we've got ground covers or grass, or I mean, no, no grass, but permanent stuff that doesn't require mowing. That was part of our whole objective. And the chickens. Do you want questions as you go along? Yeah, you can do, sure, sure. Because otherwise, I think we got, well, we're going to have a little less time. That because we started late, but we can, we'll see how it goes. Now, how, how do you start? Hens or chicks? You can buy pullets, which are teenage hens, or mature hens, or buy chicks, baby, baby chicks. They're usually about one day old when you get them. And they're shipped, and they arrive at the feed store. They're about, the going rate is between three fifty and four dollars now for a baby chick. And a pullet will, since there's a lot of time and energy put into a pullet, will be about twice that. And they've got a whole life ahead of them. Um, so you can understand when you think of the cost involved in rate, keeping it six or eight months before a baby chick will be ready to lay eggs. And so the, there's a lot of time and energy put into that pullet. But pullets are best for a start for folks. They're ready to, nearly ready to lay. And and since they make eggs as part of their nature, you don't need the roosters either, unless you want fertile eggs. Now, some people swear on the advantage of fertile eggs, but in our town and many other towns, roosters are illegal. You can't keep roosters because of the 430 chorus, which starts up, and if a rooster, here's another rooster over in the other part of the neighborhood. We have a rooster that's running wild just a few streets from us. They'll go back and forth and get each other excited. And every five, ten minutes, they'll be another crow from 4.30 on till, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning. So, and then they slow off, and then they might sing again later. We even had a, a hen that stopped laying in the fall. I've dispatched her since. She's, uh, she started to crow. We could, maybe she had enough testosterone. She was the, the lead hen. She was the head of the flock, and she must have had enough testosterone in her when her estrogen cut, that cut out. What kind of chickens do you recommend? Well, I, I, was, I was getting to that. It, when you start with hens, uh, there are 
I've had good experience with Australorps, which are blind, the black Australorps, an Australian chicken. They're black and shiny. Uh, Rhode Island Red and Plymouth Rock are New England breeds, and I'm not so sure about here, the heat. But they might not do as well. Might, but we had a le couple of Lagrans, they're little white chickens that are prolific layers, high energy, that did quite well with us. And uh, the only thing is they're pretty, they're, they're being white, they, they're a pretty good target at night. But, you know, hopefully they'll go into the coop and hide. But this last batch I got are called Golden uh, Comet, or Golden Sex Link. The hens are buff colored from the day they hatch, the roosters are yellow white. This color differentiation is a handy tool in separating from for when they're first hatched. I saw an episode of the TV program, uh, Dirty Jobs, about people who chicken sex for a living. They're usually little Asian women, and they, every second they pick up a turnover a little chick and check sex organs, and then they sort them out. You know, the roosters go in one bin, and the, the hen chicks go in another. So roosters are, are generally, if they're raised, they're raised for, for slaughter. And if they're, so three or four months, and then they're slaughtered when they're still tender. But hens, of course, will have lived commercially two or three years, but you can, a chicken could live and probably not lay eggs for another 10 years besides that. So if you like the company of a chicken and no eggs, well. Oh, so you yeah. say usually a hen will lay eggs for 10 years? No, 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 for three or four years. And they have only have so many eggs in them, like most birds and humans. There's only so many, so many eggs in them, and, and then when they run out of eggs, that's pretty much the end of the cycle. They're metaphors, chicken applause. <laughs> Egg applause. Oh, we're ready for a couple more lines and lilies here. Why couldn't the chicken find her eggs? She mislaid them. Why did the chicken, what did the chicken do when she, he saw a bucket of fried chicken? He kicked the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the alternative is to start with the baby chicks. If you have kids, or you're a kid at heart like me, baby chicks come home with you from the feed store without thinking about it. I couldn't resist either. Essential for good baby chick care. A draft-free plastic bin, big cardboard box, or a brooder, which is a commercial manufactured thing with a light and ventilation. It'll, it's unnecessary since you're only talking about the first month of their lives. I think you can get by, and all the time I grew up, we, we had uh, cardboard boxes. or If you have enough cardboard boxes or bins, I, you can... I started mine in a in a plastic storage bin the first 10 days or so. And now that they're getting their wings, they like to fly around a bit and get, so I'm, I want to give them more space. On Sunday or Monday, I'm going to move them into a bigger a box, cardboard box that's about three foot on the side. Then they'll have more room to play. Yes? What? We already put our chickens in, the, in our chicken coop and we're... Your babies? No, they're How old are they? Old and, and, and so they got all their feathers. And one of them is a rooster and he almost flew out the door. Yeah, you have to be careful when they love to fly. Or, or a cat would eat them. What can you do to stop a chicken from flying out of the way? You can clip one wing, meaning you take scissors and cut the ends off the wings. Not, don't get clipped. You have to be careful and not get... Here's the little chicken's arm, and the wings are sticking out from the chicken's wing, so you have to be careful to clip close in, but not, don't cut the skin when you do that. That doesn't hurt anyway. Well, they don't have any feeling in, in it's, it's essentially, I mean, it's a live wing, but, it, and they just, they, they just seem a little embarrassed by it. So if you clip one wing, they will fly in a circle. No. If you clip both wings, the wings will grow back equally, and then they'll be able to fly and maneuver sooner than if you clip one wing, I find. And it's a lot easier than clipping both wings, and less traumatic for them, or embarrassing. I'm, I'm embarrassed by it. <laughs> so in addition, for the babies, you need a light or a heat bulb, 
set up at a distance, not right on top of them, but say I wired it into the top of the box, and it only you only need about a 60 watt bulb to produce. You can tell how they react to the heat. The first week of life, they've only got their down, their fluffy down. And then the, now they're st they start to develop their tail and wing feathers in the second week. And by four or five weeks, they've got all their feathers in there. But each successive week, they have more resistance and they're stronger, run around more, they, and they can take more different temperatures. That first week, that lamp is a lot like their mom. They've got to get under that and rest, like a baby and human. They end up sleep. They they seem to sleep, eat, and poop, and that's about all they do for the first week. The second week, they start to be more interesting and get around a lot. Waterers, feeders. Here's an example of the, the waterer. I don't use this for the baby chicks, but for the adults and the teenagers. This has been a little worse for the wear, but it's still working. It used to be clear plastic, and it's got kind of foggy. This is just something you might find at a Walmart or somewhere you know that sells uh, dog water, as you see. And it's got a little valve, simple <coughs> valve here, so that when you put it in place, it holds the water until you put it in place where you can go like this and then quick flip it around. And then this tray will fill with water, and it's good for about two or th three days. The only problem is when you get hot weather, algae can develop on the inside, and if you have chlorinated water in the city, well, that's the best solution is to scrub that algae out with tap water, because that's not good for chickens. I keep this up a, up a little higher. If, if this is right on ground level with the chickens, they can tend to walk in it, or, or they're scratching around, and they'll fill it up full of dirt and, and to try this real quickly. So if I set it up on a block, a brick, something, give it a little height, it keeps cleaner and it's less hassle for me. But with baby chicks, I come up with the finally came up with a brilliant solution <coughs> after all these years. I've got a, a little heavy duty ceramic bread pan and it's heavy enough that they can't tip it over. And I set it down in there in the corner the best solution for baby chicks is to put their food in the water in the far corners so they can't be running over it and making wreaking havoc with the food, which I think they're just kids, and that's what they do. It keeps the whole mess cleaner and there's less hassle because, well, with my chicks, I like to use the, either sawdust and soil, even as at their early age, at three days old, one of them was burrowing down into the into the soil from the compost bin, and it's very sandy in, in Savannah, and sitting there under the lamp and dusting itself just like it was an adult. Already this dusting behavior. What's that dusting behavior about? Well, I was getting around to that. In order to uh, a natural deterrent for mites and chicken lice, this is something that. They only live on chickens. I know, when I was a kid, I first encountered them when I cleaned the chicken coop out in the spring and got all, all over my hands. But they can't survive on human beings because of body temperature difference. Chickens are a lot warmer. I think their body temperature is, what, 102, maybe 110? Quite a bit warmer than we are. And so the, the lice respond to that. And we had a problem with our first batch of chickens second batch of chickens, in that we tried to keep them in the coop more confined and move the coop around the garden a bit. Talking about chicken tractor, that'll come later. And, but the, they didn't get enough sunshine and, and a space in that confinement to dust properly. And so before we knew it, we had, especially in the winter, we had a lice problem. And, but as soon as we let them out of the coop where they could dust, lo and behold, it disappeared. Before, we didn't realize that it was just a matter of dusting, and we tried, um, oh, what's that stuff that, um, oh, we use it in the garden to deter critters. It's, uh, oh, sh diatomaceous earth. We use diatomaceous earth in the nesting boxes where it was the worst. 
and then help knock it out a bit. So that's another alternative if you haven't got the space. Diatomaceous earth is a great tool for that. Yep, time for get to the here. How do chickens dance? Chick to chick. <laughs> Why didn't the chicken skeleton cross the road? He didn't have the guts. <laughs> All right. I think we're doing pretty good on time here. We have to be finished in 20 minutes? Okay. So, a chicken coop. Once your chicks are ready, big enough to, to move into the coop outdoors and can handle the cold, cooler temperatures at night. You can get a found item, clean out a corner of a shed, a storeroom, or your garage to have tight, watertight quarters. Any safe, dry place will do. You store, if you store your feed in this coop, use a metal container with tight-fitting lid set up where it won't rust. That's very important. Why metal instead of plastic? Any ideas? So rats can't. Right, rats and mice will chew right through plastic. It's amazing. And I did have a problem. I had a plastic container in the house. I kept the chicken feed. Now I've been keeping the chicken feed in the house because I figure on a cold, not cold morning, it's like giving them a warm breakfast. But it. But I had problems at the bottom of the plastic bin. There were rats getting in. I put. I just put a layer of plastic bags and that deterred them so that there was a barrier for them and they couldn't make it through that barrier. So if you have a problem, our chicken food storage was something we just picked off the street. It was a <coughs> plastic bin that somebody had already gotten rid of. Um, I mean, if you're a scrounger like I am, that's you can find some of these things, say if you look online, Craigslist or FreeCycle websites, you can get a coop or ra old rabbit cage, an abandoned kid's playhouse. If your kids are too old for the playhouse, add wire to the windows to make it varmint proof. Uh, we've built, let's see, let me describe how this works, great. Off the internet we've got a design that we built in the first year and it's still, six years later, it's still working. I'm going to give a kind of an A-frame structure. There's the hidden back leg, right? So it's got four legs. And then the, these are the handles on either end coming out the back. So the two people on either side can pick it up and move it. There's a, a screened-in area down below with a little opening here, door, also screened. Now this is something you, you can find, this basic design you can find on the internet. On this end, we've got a, a latch side that opens up, and inside are the laying boxes. So you can access the coop from the outside, which is very handy, especially since they like it dark, and when they're laying, they like their privacy. So that up here is the level that the chickens are at. Does that make sense? <coughs> Down below, we this, when we first designed this coop, we kept we kept them down below all the time. It's uh, bottom, the lower measurement is four by six. And we had four chickens in the four by six. So it was, it was pretty tight and they weren't too happy with that. Even though we moved it every couple of days. So they had fresh ground. And in the since then we've opened this up and they run, they, they spend the night in the coop and they run around in a larger area that we have is 20 by 30. It's all fenced in. We got all the screen, all, all the fencing, a uh, woven wire fencing rather than chicken wire. Woven wire tends to be kind of recti rectilinear, and chicken wire has this uh, 
hexagonal look to it, and it's a lot lighter weight. We actually, for, for lightness, for lightweight, we use, we have some plastic wire we put in here at the bottom, and that adds to the lightweight of the, uh, the only thing that might add a lot of weight is if you had a metal roof on this. We ended up using vinyl siding from our, from our house. When our house had been vinyl sided about, before we bought it, about 12 years ago maybe. And under the house was all this vinyl siding left over. And it was just enough, we had to patch it a little bit, but to make two sides of this roof. So we have vinyl siding going all the way up here, vinyl on um, quarter inch plywood maybe. And so the whole thing maybe weighs 60 pounds, I think. And important not to use two by fours in the main members here, but one by So you have one and a quarter. Is, I guess if you, two by four is actually, well, it's not two, really two foot. It's more like uh, one and two and inches. By three and a half. One and three quarters, one and a half. So a one by is more like three quarters by three quarters. It's half. And so that's important in keeping it lightweight. If you if you use two by fours, it would be unless you have a lot of strong people around it. I'd rather not have to. If you're moving this quite a bit, it's easier to do it with just two folks rather than have to get four people out to move. The other thing that I like about this coop is here in the middle. Oh, and then there's a, another feature is the roost that runs the length. Across the chickens are birds, and what they like to do at night is roost. If they can, they can get up. It's a safety mechanism built, you know, into their DNA, I guess, you know, to keep away from predators. But here is a hole, and uh, in the design, maybe I should use another color. Is a ramp. Now during the day, comes they come down the hall, and I pull up the ramp with a little wire or string attached up through here. My only problem with that is that was the string because of friction over time going up and down. It, uh, I had to replace it every six months or so. Oh, the other end, opposite the egg, egg boxes, flips open too. And I can take from the other end, it's a square platform, right? I can take a hoe, pull a hoe in there, garden out, and scrape it all out. And that works pretty well, especially if they have, if they have some kind of litter, um, sawdust, straw, in the leaves, something that helps absorb the manure. Because when they're roosting at night, what they seem to do is poop all night. So you've got accumulation of, you know, in a week or two, you've got already got a pretty good accumulation. It's right, but it's mostly right underneath the roost. So you don't have to go into the corners, you just have to go into the center where they're roosting, because that's where all the, the poop will be. So you only have two nest boxes for four chickens? Yeah, that's fine. So they share, right? Yeah, well, yeah, sometimes you'll find them sharing. I try to encourage them, but I put an egg, a, a fake egg, I use a ceramic and, and a marble egg in each of the boxes to encourage them to use them, but they seem to want to always go to one or the other, um, and then they'll wait until the head chicken goes in and lays her egg, and then the next, and it's the pecking order. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, all right, so there's the coop. The other thing I talked about is, now in this design, the chicken run is just down below the coop, which didn't work for us. It might work if you only have two chickens. I think it would be in enough space for two to be happy. But they get through that, they scratch up that soil and they're ready for a new place. So unless you're willing to move the coop every couple of days, and that's what we did, in our first year, but it got kind of tiresome. So we opened up a chicken run, just adjacent, or in, so the coop was inside this run. And it also happened to be our laundry area, so it's where we hang our clothes, and um, which is pretty compatible with chickens. 
Uh, an advantage of having a clothesline strung across this area is that it deters daytime predators, which are mainly flying problems. Hawks of various sizes. We've even had a hawk that would it landed on top of the coop, and and you can hear it calling to the baby in the tree, saying it was making a tour of the neighborhood, and here's here's easy pickings. <laughs> And the, the year prior, in the spring, there was a, I think, a peregrine. They're small hawks, but smaller than a chicken. Had come through, I think it was just passing through in the spring, and it had killed a chicken bigger than itself. And, but I heard the ruckus, and, and by, the, but by the time I got out there, it was too late, but I was able to, you, I scared away the hawk and was able to eat chicken myself. So it wasn't total loss, still. So the daytime predators, the worst daytime predators are domesticated animals that are not our predators. For instance, anybody else? Dogs are the worst. Dogs are the absolute worst. Yes? Cats. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two cats, Fluff and Lucky, keep trying to get in the chicken house every time we open the door. But if they're, when they're little. I don't think a cat will attack a big chicken, full-grown chicken. Yeah. Yeah, unless it, unless it has to go uh, to get in a tussle with the rooster. Yeah, right. If you yeah, have my rooster, mom said that... That's an advantage of having a rooster is the rooster is there to do what? The rooster is there, he, he's a protector. The bigger and tougher and he's there to protect the hens. Yeah. His hens. My mom said that... that he, one time, he never went back and it again. <laughs> right, that's the kind of the rooster. But dogs... I, I've had, had this happen to me numerous times in my life where I've been called in because I knew I, I could deal with disasters like this where dogs had come in and just pack of dogs or even a single dog broken into the hen house and killed all the chickens just just snapped their necks and hadn't even hardly touched them, hadn't eaten any of them, but just for sport, yeah. which is dog, you know, the dogs love the chase. And so I ended up with, you know, with mutilated chickens to have to rescue. Sometimes they were half alive, and so it was, it was pretty sad to have to deal with this kind of situation. Ideally, well, we want to get to that at the end, we can talk about... Pardon? Yeah. So, um, do you find that if there is a dog that kind of is in the yard, yeah. that the chickens won't lay because they're anxious, or? You know, I haven't, I haven't had a dog in the yard with us. We don't have own a dog, so I don't know how that situation would be. Small dogs. Now, Jane Fishman, who's giving a lecture, she has a couple of small dogs, and I think they're not as intimidating to chickens because of the size. But I don't know. Uh, we have dogs. And you keep chickens as well. I have six chickens and four dogs. And, um, wow. And, and, one, and, I've, and I've lost a chicken to one of my dogs. All sizes of dogs because they're mutts. Yeah. And uh, the chickens lay just fine. Um, and in fact, we've raised, we found with the chicks in the house. Yeah. Um, those chicks don't really understand that they're not dogs. They look at Well, everything. they think of themselves they, as dogs. And, they, and the dogs and the chickens are... In fact, I walked in my husband's office the other day, four dogs, one chicken under the desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four dogs, so, um, the chickens and dogs Cuddling are together. fine. That's wonderful to hear. I think part of it is being raised together. Yes. I think if you brought a hen in that wasn't used to dogs, it, it would be difficult. The will, will stand up, they'll peck the dogs. Um, That's what ours do. They peck them. And dogs well, don't the, like to be They don't like them. Yeah. The cats don't like the chickens, and the chickens don't like the cats. Same way with the dogs. Yeah. We have an extra layer of protection. Our chicken run is within, a, our whole yard is fenced off. So unless somebody forgets and leaves the door open, and a, and a dog will wander down the street and into our backyard, which is pretty unlikely. Um, our, my friend Jane, who called me when she had a dog attack and, and kill all her chickens, she had no fence to the street. And she just had the coop in the back, and it was just clear of sailing for the dog to come back right off the street and go in there and attack her chickens. So I think it'd be wise if you want to, if you want to have protection from dogs to have that second layer of protection. Ideally, you'd have your chickens in the back where dogs from the street, if you have dogs coming down the lane or in the street, if you have wild dogs or semi-wild dogs, stray dogs, 
they're going to be looking for free lunch or looking to have a little excitement. Do you just put your the fencing for your run? Do you have it? into the ground, like they say, you know, buried Yes, the yeah, I mean, yeah, ideally, we have woven wire which is stiffer. Now, if you had, if you had chicken wire, it's softer and can be crunched up. You know, it's easier for a dog to get under. Now, if you don't, if you only have chicken wire and don't have woven wire, you can put a, a piece of wood around the base and attach the chicken wire firmly to that, and that will be, and you can anchor that piece of wood into the ground. But you don't have trouble with them digging under them? We have, well, we haven't had, I only know that people, other folks that have problems with dogs, we haven't, in our situation, we've been... Well, I was more Jane, worried about raccoons, raccoons, actually. Yeah, now raccoons are more of a country thing. If you're in the suburbs, then we're too close into town, we don't get raccoons. Our main predator in the night is possums. Mm. And we're only, possums are kind of, love to travel up the streams and, and the waterways. So we're, and we're only about six blocks from a, a waterway, so the possums make the circuit at least once every spring and come visit our coop. Now, uh, there's a, I found a, a solution, where is that? Oh yes, it's this. Where is my thing about predators? Oh, oh, oh. Off hmm. Oh, well, anyway, a way to get around the possums is if you had a baby monitor out there, which you can get for $20 or even cheaper. And then, uh, in my case, we have somebody living in, with that hears down on the first floor that hears that if there's a ruckus going on. If there's an excitement in the middle of the night, it's always two or three o'clock in the morning when you're, you know, right in the deepest sleep yeah. is when the possums come to visit. And if they've been there once, they're going to come back again. So it's best for your sanity to deal with possums on their first visit. Possums, I'm heartless about possums, I'm afraid to say. They only live about two years, so if you shorten their life by one year, well. Uh, <laughs> And they're just, and they, but they have nasty little teeth, so don't, don't, don't even think about getting close to them. And they're slow moving, so once you've heard the ruckus, you've got enough time to put on clothes or whatever. They can move. They can move. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, the possums in Savannah are retarded, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, they tend to play dead, too. Yeah, yeah, they, so, if I, I grab the garden fork, and I'm able to get it on the end of a fork, but I can put it in the rain barrel. Oh, you know, and you nobody's know, too squeamish. And we always have a rain barrel to catch rainwater, and it's nearly always full, or at least one of them is full enough, so I can hold the, the possum down into the rain barrel and dispatch it that way. And then I'll have the carcass to, well, I buried a number of possums under our lemon tree or under the fig bush. And, it's a wonderful fertilizer. <laughs> Don't try to feed them to the chickens. Chickens do love a varied diet. Now, you can buy, with baby chicks, you buy a chick starter. I got a bag, of 25 pound bag for my seven chicks. And that should probably do them until, for the next month until they're ready to move to larger food. Uh, I think I, I eased them into some kind of grits or something coarser before I got them onto adult food at that point, once they were, but I, you know, it's, it's been three years since I, I last had baby chicks. It's good for me to have that again, so it, it, it uh, stirred my memory. Do you recommend any particular memory. kind of food? Uh, don't most of them come with antibiotics and all that stuff? Do you yes, that's true. Yeah, that? with chicks started, with chicks, I don't know if you want to mess around. And for a 10 bucks for a 25 pound bag, I think you're, they're on a good start. Although it's interesting, I, try, I, I give chicks right away, I give them opportunities to eat uh, greens from the garden. So I bring them chickweed. Anybody know what chickweed is? It's a little green that, that grows all over uh, this part of the world, all through the winter months. A little stemmy thing. You'll find it in every little flower pot. And it's ubiquitous in town. And it grows especially through the winter months and it stops growing, and you can eat it like salad. It tastes 
a lot like sweet corn. Sweet corn like it's very sweet, and chicks love it. Uh, the, the other thing is tender. It's so tender they can handle it. Lettuce leaves. When we're when we're harvesting lettuce, we we also have a garden, a lettuce garden that, that we we make salad on Saturdays. And whatever salad we figure isn't good enough for the public, if it's got holes or brown or whatever, the chickens are only too glad to eat that. They want to eat arugula or spicy stuff. They they like more tender, but all the, all the cabbage family, broccoli leaves, when you're done with your broccoli plant, what do you do with the leaves, right? Well, the chickens love it. And those greens are a great source of calcium, an important thing that they need in their diet. And uh, green calcium that they get out of greens is much more metabolized, easily metabolized. For, well, women should know that too, right? And rather than take calcium supplements, to be eating your greens, is a better way to get the calcium you need. So chickens, when they're producing eggs especially, every day they're cranking out a chunk of calcium there, the coat coating for that egg, right? So the, the, another way to, to get that is to get, buy an oyster shell. And oyster shell is available, chopped, or it's kind of ground up oyster shell. Or if you're close to the beach like we are, I, every time I go to the beach, a month, every month or so, I get a bag of seashells. Especially when they just come in on the tide, they're ground up and pretty cool, and chickens can handle them. If you know just chicken digestion, we'll go into that for a minute, they have a, their beak, and then it opens up to a crop down their throat, and that's where a lot of the stuff collects, and then it eventually makes its way to the gizzard. The gizzard is something, the internal organ that's kind of a muscular thing, tough if you've ever eaten gizzards. And, uh, that gizzard collects little grit, pebbles, depending on the size of the bird. Turkeys, I've seen turkey gizzards that are full of, like a rock tumbler at the end of the summer, but by the time you're ready to slaughter the turkeys. And he had these perfectly polished stones from tumbling around in the turkey's gizzard all, went all summer long. Anyway, so as they don't have teeth, the gizzard performs that function. And then it goes into the intestines and out again at the other end. And they do only have the cloaca, which is Latin for a sewer. Well, I don't know which came first, the chicken sewer or the, or the Roman sewer. But anyway, they inspired each other. And that the cloaca is also the place where the egg comes out. So sometimes you, it's, it can be clean, but sometimes you'll have a little bit of chicken poop to clean off those eggs. Or is, uh, we talked about the chicken run. A little bit? Yeah. What to do when you have cold weather? You can sometimes put a light, a heat lamp. Uh, we don't have that problem in Savannah, except for when you have young chicks. But we really haven't had that much cold weather, extensive cold. And when you get up into the coop here, in a protected spot like this, it stays warmer, especially in the winter. We do have, I forgot to point out the feature, up at the top corners, we have wire ventilation. I think that's an important feature to add so that there's air circulation across where the, the hot air rises and the heat will, kind of like the chimney effect, the heat and fumes will get out that way. Uh, chicken tractors. Anybody got a large farm like you have a big a lot of space. You can build yourself a chicken tractor. What's a chicken tractor? It doesn't oh, have an engine. Had to, like, you do? We actually have two chicken tractors. Oh, you want to talk about them, though? Well, really, they're a lot like that. You know? Yeah, they're well, but you can move them around, right? And they're lower to the ground. Sometimes they'll have a box attached for them to go into at night. They don't need that much space at night. We built them ourselves. Right, you can build We're yourself. We're upgraded to it. What you consider a chicken house. Well, here it says for every hen you need three or four square feet of playroom in the daytime. So the chicken tractor is two feet high, four feet wide, and six feet long, with some kind of shelter to protect them from the rain. So half of it has got a, a little metal or a plastic cover to keep. If they don't like the rain, that's pretty crucial. I should point that ours, out. Ours love them. They'll just go out in the rain and get all wet. Really? But don't they like to dry out a little bit? 
Well, that's not my experience with chickens. They, they'd rather, they like dry weather. And it's a it's a um, what's, what have you got? We've got a lot of mixed breeds. We've got a black off floor rooster. Uh -huh. Then we've got two American Lions. And then we've got a Rhode Island Red. They all get along pretty well? Yes, sir. They all get along pretty well. Oh, that's great. Were they raised as kids together? Yep. We actually got these all at different times. Now, I find it's better for the in a small flock like I have to have all the same variety. When I had nothing but Araucanas and I had to replace them, well, the, the, the two Legerans only grudgingly got along with the rest of the Araucanas, and then the Australorp that I brought in, she didn't go along with them, and so it became a little bit of a struggle. The most difficult was a barred rock that I brought in. They hold themselves a lot differently than most chickens. They're much more upright, and uh, maybe that barred rock had a personality issue, but he never, she was never accepted by the rest of the flock, and very unhappy. We've got that problem. Yeah. We've and what do you do in that one. case? You, I, I, I have no. If a chicken is miserable, I don't want to keep having a miserable chicken, so uh, I dispatch them. I, I, I grew up with uh, chicken axes and dealing with the uh, chickens at the, at the end of their lives lifespan. Compost bucket. When I grew up, we didn't have a compost bucket. It was chicken bucket. And just about anything you, table scraps, you chickens will love to pick through. Anything that you haven't eaten, grains, protein, uh, little bit, they love cheese and dairy products. Um, cooked rice, grits, when I'm done. eggshells. Well, now, what happens if you let them eat the eggshells? They'll like the eggs. Right, so you'll have them eating the eggs right out of the nest. So. If you're going to give them eggshells or access to eggshells, what I do is I hide the eggshells at the bottom of the compost bin and break them up so that they, they don't have any fresh egg smell about them. They smell like coffee grounds or I mean, anything but egg at that point. And then when they run across them, they'll eat them, but they won't associate that eggshell. It's pure calcium. They won't associate it with a raw egg. And I have only, in my six years, I've only had one hen who occasionally it ate an egg. And I thought, maybe, what, what's, is she missing something in her diet? Maybe, maybe it's my fault. But luckily, she didn't do it regularly. I was lucky. If you have a chicken that's an egg eater, I say, if you can, replace that chicken or get rid of it, because it can be a, a real bother to have the mess just to, the, well, they don't eat the whole egg. They, it's, half of it goes to waste, and it's messing up. The laying box, and it makes a mess. Free roosters. Sometimes you can get a free rooster. Uh, I'm known in the neighborhood in the feed store for somebody who will take on a free rooster. The only problem is I got one when, when they were chicks, and I put them in with the, the adult hens, but they don't get along so well with the adult hens. Baby chicks and adult hens. So I, I set up a separate, I, my yard was big enough that I had a little corner just for those babies. This was the middle of the summer, so they didn't need, didn't need additional heat. And, and eventually, when they're about four months old, three months, I let them run together. And they had been alongside, they got to know each other, even though there was a wire in between. And the hens would fly into their coop and that kind of thing. So th they had a lower fence, because it was kind of a mini area. And then the roosters adopt. Well, the hens adopted the roosters, and they ended up uh, after the possum attack. The roosters said, "We're not going to sleep in that coop anymore." And the roosters got them sleeping up out in the in the grapevines. And every night they were out there. I guess the roosters were going to protect them, but I had to dispatch the roosters as they started to crow. And. And Savannah, as I pointed out, they are illegal against the law. If neighbors complain about your roosters crowing, well, you've got to do something about it. <coughs> but it's uh, nothing more wonderful than uh, a five-month-old rooster that you raise yourself. The flavor is wonderful. Called call that. It's a French dish made with a young rooster, marinated in white wine. Uh, gosh, we run over, but we did start late, so you've only... Uh, we better get going so you can get to the next. But, but the roosters will protect against the Yes.